My name is Patrick J. McGinnis, and I coined the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out, and it's why some people end up following the crowd. But we're not like them. We're part of a new species that isn't afraid to do things differently. I call us FOMO sapiens. And this is the show where you'll meet people like us, phenomenal FOMO sapiens, to learn how they find the courage and the ideas to live exceptional lives. FOMO. FOMO. Hey, everybody. Welcome to FOMO Sapiens, the show for people who don't just follow the crowd, but instead take their own path to success in business and in life. I'm your host, Patrick J. McGinnis, venture capitalist by day, author and podcaster by night, FOMO Sapiens 24-7. And today we're going to be talking with a really one of my favorite thinkers and a kind of a legend, I guess, at this point. We could say Keith Ferrazzi. And Keith has written a new book that is called Competing in the New World of Work, How Radical Adaptability Separates the Best from the Rest. And it really focuses on how the pandemic forced organizations and teams to adapt to new and often better ways of operating. And so rather than going back to you know the old way of doing things, going back to normal as it were, Keith talks about how we can redesign work and leadership based on what we learned in the crisis. And so that's what we're gonna do. Now, if you're not familiar with Keith, he is the chairman of Farazi Greenlight and the Greenlight Research Institute, where he works to identify behaviors that block global organizations from reaching their goals and to transform them by coaching new behaviors that increase growth and shareholder value. Formerly, he was the CMO of Deloitte and of Starwood Hotels, and he's written a couple of very successful books. In fact, two New York Times bestsellers. The first one was Never Eat Alone, and the second is Who's Got Your Back? His next book, Competing in the New World of War, Work is out now by Harvard Business Review Press. And he has obviously been published all over the place, including the Wall Street Journal, Harvard Business Review, Inc., and Fast Company. And in this conversation, you're going to learn, first of all, just like how to think about preparing yourself for this new world we're getting into, how we can basically overcome the isolation, the polarization of the world around us to build together and how we can design our work better in the post-pandemic world. And he's going to tell us, it's a great story, actually, just kind of all of these anecdotes of how big companies and teams are repositioning themselves for the future and also about companies that did it before the pandemic and were better prepared and how we can actually do that in the future ourselves. Now, I have a small ask. My small ask is this. I have this LinkedIn course called Navigating Fear of Missing Out the workplace, which very much fits into this kind of conversation about where the world is going today. And so I just wanted to share that with you in, in case you're thinking about, you know, oof, I'm in a sort of a new world of work and I have FOMO because I'm not at the office all the time or I'm lost or whatever it is that you're feeling right now. Go check it out at LinkedIn Learning, Navigating Fear of Missing Out at Work. Go check it out. Let me know what you think. All right. And now onto the interview. As you know, I always ask the same question and I started my conversation with Keith asking him this. What is the most important decision that you've had to make to get to where you are today? Yeah, I'm not sure you really want the the most powerful answers. Um, but let me try to give you a couple of them. There have been some big ones, and I've had I've had a lot of time to reflect about, on this recently. One could argue that early on, having been brought up a very poor kid in southwestern Pennsylvania, whose old man was God bless him, a hardworking steel worker, unemployed most of my life because of the steel crash. Uh, um, I had to make a fundamental decision to, to separate and divorce from that family of origin and pursue a very different path that was alien to all of us. Of course, with the blessing of my parents, but um, you know, I moved out of the house when I was 17 and went to... Uh, an old boys boarding school and had to support myself economically all my life. So I think there was an early decision, which was difficult, you know, as a strong Italian family to separate from anything that looked like what my family of history was. Nobody had ever gone to school, et cetera, and, and, and carve a new path. Yeah, that, that is, by the way, I did want the deep answer and I appreciate you giving it to me. Because I think for I'll give you the deeper answer later in the interview. All right. Maybe that'll keep somebody listening, but I also don't want to scare them away too much early on. <laughs> okay. I, I, I think a lot of people resonate with that kind of story because, you know, as somebody who grew up in a small town in Maine where the kinds of things I ended up doing, I just didn't it's nothing wrong with it, but just I didn't have those kinds of examples. A lot of times, you know, the people who are traveling a path that's a little different 
have to make some hard decisions along the way, important decisions along the way, but eventually those get them, you know, to where they want to be. Now, we connected a number of years ago, back in 2015 now, when I was calling people to get blurbs for my first book, The 10% Entrepreneur. And you didn't know, I mean, you took a chance on me and I, I really am appreciative of that. Well, somebody on, I have to say that I read the book subsequently myself, but somebody on my team had to read that book to say, okay. So it was a, it was a, it passed a threshold of, of quality that was worthy of the blog. I didn't just throw it on everything. Oh no. I, I, I was, I remember when, when we chatted, you, you, we talked about it. And so anyway, that was a big moment for me because it's like somebody who I really looked up to and still look up to does that and, and gives me that sort of pat on the, on the shoulder. And so, you know, your first book, uh, which I read and was as somebody who's an, you know, kind of external person I really loved was never eat alone. Now over the last couple of years, it's been harder to eat out at the restaurants. So I'm curious, yeah. just as I was thinking about this today, I was like, what, how, how has your eating schedule and networking schedule been over the last couple of years? Well, I'll tell you something. Um, I've learned a lot since Never Eat Alone, a lot. I mean, I've learned um, a lot personally that's allowed me to embrace a greater degree of authenticity and humility that probably didn't exist in that book. Um, but I, I also learned that you can run around individually networking, but the day you decide to build a community is the day that you really have leverage and that your mission has power. Mm -hmm. So what I learned in this past year is I really doubled down on my mission, which was I believe that we can change the world by changing how people work. We, we spend more time at work than we spend anywhere else. I wanted to be a preacher when I was a kid. Now I realize I have people five days a week, not one. And the idea that we can reboot society, reboot humanity, reboot um, personal relationships through the workplace has always been my, my ethos. So what I did this past year is I started organizing virtual dinners. So I've had a series of dinners this past year with unicorn CEOs. Patrick, you mentioned a bit of some of your personal investment. Love to share offline what I've seen. And I too have uh, my own investment arm. But the idea of bringing unicorn CEOs together to share their struggles what is it like? And most of us don't think it's much of a struggle to be on, on a rocket ship of a unicorn company, but it's incredibly stressful for these folks uh, for so many different reasons. And I hold space for them. And I hold space for them to, to coach each other. I've done the same thing in the mental well-being space uh, of CEOs specifically in the mental well-being community. Um, and that's ranging as broad as the CEO of Headspace, who's an amazing woman, CC Morgan, who um, is recently exited. Also, um, individuals like um, Ronan Levy, who's the CEO of a company called Field Trip, utilizing ketamine clinics and psychedelics for mental well-being. So really, I've opened the aperture of this mental well-being space. And then this, this book that we're going to be chat chatting about today was designed by 2,000 executives in small peer-to-peer -peer focus groups, looking at how do we change the way that we lead in a post-pandemic world to adapt to this radical volatility that we're living in today. And I did it all through these dinner forums. I hosted dinner forums all throughout the year. 2,000 executives, 300 of them came to di di distinct forums during this period of time. So um, you you ask me, you know, well, what do you do when you can't eat alone? I have not been eating alone. I'd been I'd been uh, voracious in my in my networking dinner appetite. That is fantastic. And by the way, I think we all learn that you, when you do that, you can have dinner with people in four cities at once, which is actually kind of, I think that's here to stay. Amazing. Right? Amazing. amazing. Yeah. I mean, I, I hope it is. I hope that, um, I think people have become meeting fatigued yeah. and that's one of the big lessons of the book, which is, you know, one of the great things we learned is that collaboration doesn't have to start with a meeting. The highest performing teams during the pandemic were those who leaned into and leveraged asynchronous collaboration. They, they didn't just throw meeting after meeting, droning on and on, which were all just dragged us underwater in our energy. But instead, they, they leveraged these amazing technology tools to reinvent the way we work, not just put technology on top of the old way we work. And that's why I, I came up with my research institute study name was let's not ever go back to work. Let's only go forward to work. And that was the 
that was the earmark of why I brought all these folks together, figuring out how we can go forward to work. Now, the, the name of the book kind of says it all, Competing in the New World of Work, How Radical Adaptability Separates the Best from the Rest. Now, that's a big idea. And I, I imagine you didn't, I mean, you didn't start the year, you know, you're, you're not coming in March, 2020 with that kind of insight, right? So like, but you have gotten all these insights enough to put together this, this book. So when did it happen? Like, when was the aha moment along the way where you were like, you decided, okay, this is what I want to focus on right now. Well, uh, when the pandemic hit on the 13th, I was scared shitless. Mm. For my clients, you know, like I was working with Delta Airlines at the time, we lost 90% of our revenue overnight, right? I mean, I was coaching the executive team there, 90% of our revenue. So I was scared shitless for my clients. I was scared, you know, I'm a 55 year old man who was heavily invested in the stock market. And, you know, I all of a sudden saw a pretty precipitous drop in my own portfolio, right? I was scared for myself. At the same time, none of my clients that were in the pipeline, I coach executive teams, none of my clients that were in the pipeline were thinking about adding a coach to their repertoire, right? They were basically in survival mode. Now, my existing clients knew how important the work we were doing was to their team, but new client ground to a halt. So here I am twiddling my thumbs, um, asking myself, where do I spend my time? And I realized that this could be a real inflection point for the future of the work and my mission. And I said, I am committed to working a research project. Now, I thought it would be a month or two, right? So I called Adi Ignatius uh, over at Harvard Business School Press. And I said, Adi, I think this is never before have we seen something like this. I want to write a book about what we're going to learn during this pandemic. He said, got it. He greenlit this thing so fast. Um, and then I went out to multiple brands, you know, like Dell and Salesforce and so many. I mean, we raised $2 million in sponsorship for this research Wow! and cumulatively pulled together the greatest set of research insights that I'm very proud that Harvard's picked as their top book coming out of the pandemic. So the reality is, you know, the longer the pandemic went, the more money I raised, the more research we did. I thought it was a two month project. It ended up being a two and a half year project. And I'm thrilled by the outcome of the research because I've never done this kind of in-depth primary research before. This is the first time we really um, we really approached our intellectual property this way. As you know, Never Eat Alone was born from you know uh, thirty years of experience coming out of poor poverty into you know a thriving, uh, successful young entrepreneur and leader that I was. That Brett created Never Eat Alone. Twenty years of work with teams created Leading Without Authority, which was my last book. Two years of work of research created this book. Yeah, it's a different way of doing things because a lot of times business books are a person who has had a lived experience right. and they have built an expertise and then they kind of like share their playbook with you. They're not doing primary research like a scientist would, right? And so this is- a or Jim Collins, I think Jim Collins did, you know, good to great. Sure. What I really, my model was Jim. I wanted to create- the good to great for the next, the next horizon of leadership. FOMO. FOMO. Let's start just kind of digging in. I mean, the way I think about having, having read the book and thought about it a little bit, it's sort of like, you know, first of all, technology is here to stay. Some of these changes are here to stay. Um, we have all this infrastructure of the old work world. Like just think about all the things that, that are just like built, right? And now we're radically shifting into this post-pandemic world that's going to look very different. And we've got to, you know, we can't just go back. I mean, that, that those days are done. So tell us about the the workforce of the future. And I guess, you know, it's the book is about sort of how to compete in that. But I actually want to just think about how, because it's been a rough kind of couple of years, like what should we be excited about? Like, what, like tell me some happy things, you know, I think mm. that's really important. Yeah, thank you for that. I appreciate that. I'll tell you a couple of things we should be happy about. Um, and one of the things we uncovered in the book is that there were some myths that most of us and myself, this was so exciting for me. There are some fundamental myths that we were operating under that in reality, we need to discard and adopt fundamentally new practices and reboot our mindset. So um, one of them that I'm most excited about, frankly, is mental health and mental well-being. And the myths associated with that is that is a personal that's a very personal factor. 
my mental health, my resilience is about me and my resilience. And it's a private matter. And all of a sudden it became uh, a shared experience and it became vulnerability didn't need to be a private matter. And it became the highest performing teams leaned into each other and helped lift each other's energy up. We saw consistently a group of people coming together and what I call co-elevating, right? A commitment to to care for each other and lift each other up. And I think that's not going to go away. I think we're going to realize, first of all, the awakening to mental health is a critical component of, of workforce design, leadership design, team design. And then what I want to bring to the world is it's no longer an individual team sport. It's actually going to be a collective team sport. We own each other's energy. We own each other's resilience. And when are you, a lot of what we're talking about in the book is a renegotiation of the social contract. I own your success and I own your energy and we're going to cross the finish line together. That's the, that's the tipping point between a resilient team and a fatigued team. It, it's, it makes a ton of sense because if you look at the numbers, the stats around mental health in the workplace are crazy. They're, they're, they're just, there's clearly people who are being, they have gone through a lot. People are self-reporting levels of distress and feeling unwell that, that have never been seen before. But at the same time, companies, some companies get it, right? Especially, you know, companies that have the resources and the mindset to be able to, to address these kinds of things. But you think about like kind of mainline corporate America where, you know, the management teams oftentimes are operating with a completely sort of antiquated approach to the way that people work and maybe are very disconnected from the typical worker, right? When you think about CEO pay versus average worker pay, how, how different that is. So like, let, let's like have fictional company makes widgets and you come in on day one and you are coaching the team, which you do to great renown. Like what would be the kinds of things that you would, you would work with them to put into place in order to create that kind of environment that you just spoke about? So the first piece is what I was talking about relative to the social contract. Mm -hmm. The team has to awaken to willingness to voice vulnerability, willingness to own each other's. Uh, I'll do a really simple practice, which everybody can use listening to this. Um, er, once a week or once a month even, do an energy check with your team. And now there's two levels to that. One is go into the chat room and ask everybody in the team, please on a scale of zero to five, tell us what your energy is today coming into this meeting. And anybody who has a two or lower, pause and say, Patrick, are you okay? And sometimes you'll hear from Patrick, oh, you know what? My kids were just up late last night and I'm just beat, right? Fine. Or you might hear from Patrick, and I've heard this in when we do these energy checks with teams, um, you know, my, my spouse was just diagnosed with some pretty debilitative kidney challenges and we may need to transplant. Now, when you open up that degree of shared experience and the person who did say that particular thing about the transplant, that individual, that individual had been sitting on that information for two weeks on their own. Now, just being willing to have this kind of a check-in is so powerful. So that's number one. The second thing is allow yourself to, to really dip into why people are feeling the way they're feeling. I, I like to have a meeting, which is just what I call... Um, a shared experience where the whole meeting with the team is what's going on in your lives personally and professionally right now. And again, the way to do that is what's draining your energy and what's lifting your energy personally and professionally. And give people five minutes a person and then go around to the team. What that does is it creates empathy. It creates a shared experience. And as you well know, that creates psychological safety, which leads to high-performing teams who are willing to take risks, high-performing teams that were willing to give crit critical candor in the room, empathy, understanding, et cetera. So, you know, the, the idea of activating personal resilience and turning it into team resilience is a really powerful factor. And we have an entire chapter in the book on resilience. And we, sure, we can talk about corporate programs. You can talk about individual routines, but the number one predictor that we found in the chapter are the teams that actually owned each other's resilience. And that began to be the shift. Yeah. I'm curious, you know, as I'm listening to this, it sounds, it sounds like a, the kind of thing that a company that has a longer term view would embrace because it, you know, this is the way that you, you, you survive and you grow in the future. But I was also thinking, you know, I worked on wall street I worked in private yeah. equity. I worked in investment yeah. banking where, you know, like 
burnout and grinding it out is considered like a badge of it's honor. A, it's, a, it's a badge of courage, right? Precisely. Yeah. And I'm curious, like, yeah. do, how do you see no that more. playing out? Look, you. by the way, you just mentioned the worst industry on that, which is financial services. Mm. And of course, if you open the Wall Street Journal, you're going to constantly see what's going on with the financial services industry. And there, some of them are very old-minded beliefs in how work happens. And by the way, that's a whole different chapter. So there's another chapter focused on collaboration and inclusion. And some of the good things I think we've learned is I found that teams that were willing to realize that that remote or, or physical work is not a binary decision. It's not about, are we going to be remote? Or are we going to be physical? The reality is we identified something in the book called the collaborative stack. We collaborate all up and down different w- modes of collaboration. If you're really smart about it, you're going to use personal meetings for why you should use them for emotionally gritty issues, for stuff where you have to look across the the, the table and have some empathy and understanding or positivity of celebration and reward, et cetera. That's why we lean into the person, the personal meetings. On the other hand, if you want the broadest set of inputs, if you want to have bold innovation, if you want to team out with vendors and community, like, you know, companies like Lionel Basil brought their vendor community into co-creating, you know, the future of procurement for Lionel Basil, then you use remote and asynchronous because you can have hundreds and thousands of people. Federal Express, Federal Express started having meetings with 3,000 individuals co-creating the future of work, right? It's been extraordinary. So then of, as you move down, then making sure that we don't do the same thing for each types of meetings. You don't just take a physical meeting environment and port it into a Zoom room, right? And then do it the same way. You're not leveraging the tool for its effectiveness, which is breakout rooms, opening Google Docs, having conversations, getting two-way dialogue. So a a town hall should never be a one-way broadcast anymore. We're trying to get people to recognize that a town hall is an opportunity for a leader to stand up, have a point of view, and then pause and ask the question, what do you think? And then go into breakout rooms and listen, listen through shared Google Docs and that sort of thing. We've had a lot, the last couple of years, the last, I would say, five, six years where people have spent more and more time in their personal lives living inside of echo chambers where, you know, like th- think about politics and how it is, is, you know, in our country, people just sort of listen to their own side and they can't they can't dialogue anymore. And now that's coming into the workplace. We're seeing more politicization. We're seeing more division. We're seeing companies that are having to navigate ups and downs politically and all of this affects you know, employees, mental sort of mental fitness, the ability of, of companies to compete in the wider market. When you think about that sort of that sort of tension, you know, going forward, I, I only see, you know, I don't see that going away. Like, how do you how do you advise companies to work within that kind of environment? Well, look, I want to I want to make sure I hit with some of the high return practices that we saw coming out of the book. Mm-hmm. And, and let me sort of lean into this. What companies haven't recognized over the years is the power of co-creation. Mm. And and so often we get in, in, whether it's in society, fractured and siloed or in organizations, fractured and siloed. What we were able to do in hybrid work is to bring a commitment to co-creating in ways we never did before. But that requires another shift of mindset, which is it used to be that you bake your ideas in a team. And then you would you would go get buy-in, which is basically go sell your ideas and other people. But the ability to know that we can never come up with as bold a solution by ourselves as we need, but we need to invite other individuals. We've got an idea. We think it's great. It's 30% of the way there, damn it. Now we need to co-create to get it to 60% there by pulling in. If I'm, if I'm designing a new product, I want to pull in people from consumer insights, from sales, from marketing into the earliest creation. And what we find when we have these kind of co-creations is it's like scales falling off people's eyes. They realize the value in co-creation, the value of this. You know, I, I wrote a piece in, in Fast Company about the future of government and how this principle of co-elevation, if we could actually bring it to the cabinet and have the cabinet bring it to the hill, how game-changing that would be. Because we're learning now in corporations, the value transformation does not happen in silos. It happens through individuals who are evangelists reaching out and managing in networks. And that's, I think, one of the more powerful awakenings of the past year, particularly in crisis. The the way the book starts 
is we we actually have a fun correlation between Burning Man and the pandemic. And what we basically say to start of the book is what what is forged from the Burning Man community in, is is a world forged from from despair and dissent. It's a, it's a world forged from you know all of the elements against you. But what ends up happening is there's this co-creation between anarchists and uh, and 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 gun rights activists, along with sustainability people, all coming together to create a community that's a shared generosity community. And we saw it. We saw crisis bring out the best in people in these organizations. And so that's what's been exciting to me. What's been exciting to me is 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 the is the act of co-creation when people, in this case, using crisis as the reason, setting that aside and leaning in with a shared mission. And we didn't give a damn about org charts. We didn't give a damn about authority. We didn't give a damn about positional authority. We got the job done. FOMO. FOMO. There are two more concepts that I, I want to hit them before we end this interview because they're critical to the work. And I, I just want people to know what they're going to get when they buy this book. So talk about agility and talk about foresight and how they play in. Yeah. So we practiced something during the pandemic that I called crisis agile. <laughs> you know, we woke up every day, we looked around and said, okay, we had planned to do X yesterday. What did we get done? Where did we struggle? What is our next sprint? And we were in daily sprints, right? We were in daily sprints of figuring out what work we do, what do we need to change? What's, what are the environmental factors? And we, we learned how to look around corners. We became more attuned to externalities than ever before because so much was changing. We didn't just keep our head on our work. We lifted it up and we looked around corners. Now, what I found, interestingly enough, is that fewer than 15% of corporations we benchmarked had any vision that the pandemic was going to happen before March 13th lockdown. Everybody was caught in their heels. Yet the number of these organizations that had operations in China was crazy. So why were we caught on our heels? Or better, maybe the question is, what organizations weren't? Look to a company like Lockheed Aerospace. Didn't even have an operation in China, but they had a simple process of foresight where on a monthly basis, their executive team would come together as a part of their executive team meeting. Five minutes of it was allocated to something called a foresight process. And a foresight process was everybody was told, Patrick, you have the vantage point of customers. David, you have the vantage point of, of um, competition. Susie, you've got technology. Jane, you've got financial economic position in the marketplace, whatever. Everybody had a different vantage point and they had to come to the meeting with an analysis of what risks are they seeing from their vantage point and what opportunities were they seeing that we could take advantage of from in the marketplace? Now, in that five-minute break, they didn't have the debate. They didn't do report outs. They just said, who has something to offer, either a risk or an opportunity? Very few, but often somebody would say, I've got one. And then when they would talk about it, and then they would decide if that went to an assessment meeting. So somebody in at Lockheed Aerospace, somebody in December said, I've been reading some blogs about some stuff going on in China with a virus, um, you know, I'm not sure what to do. I don't know. I'm not, I, I'm not advocating we take it to an assessment meeting, but I wanted to put it on our radar. The CEO said, let's throw it into an assessment meeting. Cause I remember watching the Bill Gates Ted talk about, um, uh, uh, um, you know, the, the, the world and the future of, 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 um, of biotechnology and all the things going on. And I you know, like, let's, let's look at it. They didn't even know what to call it. Right. They took it into assessments meeting. They came prepared. Do you know that by January, they'd had a planning meeting of how to go fully virtual. And by February, they went fully virtual. Now, wow. this is available to all of us. If we start to take these simple practices of foresight and agility that we saw come to life in the pandemic, that we all practice, but we now hold on to them, we will be able to foresee and look around corners in the volatility that we've had for decades, but we didn't really, we weren't forced to deal with it the way we were during the pandemic. So I'm so proud. So we have those four chapters primarily focused on the essence of, of the future of leadership, foresight, agility, collaboration, and resilience. And then the second half of the book is how do you apply all of those things to reboot your business model, reboot your workforce design, and really look at purpose as still a fundamental core 
North Star of what you do. And that is the role model that we've given to any business that we hope uh, will will really have a great advantage in this in this in this post pandemic world. As you're talking, I'm just thinking about this notion of foresight and having a process in place because I remember on like March 11th going to lunch with a friend of mine and she had 150 and 95 masks in her house and I had zero. And I remember thinking like. I'm a guy who try. I've been to China a bunch of times. I read the news. I've been reading and I did nothing. I was completely unprepared. Yeah. And, you know, I think whether you're a business or you're a person making time to think about what's coming down the pike, it's important. So if you want to learn more about this book, go to radicallyadapt.com. And if you want to learn more about Keith, you can check him out on Instagram at Keith Ferrazzi. Keith, thank you so much for being here. Patrick, it's great to reconnect. Let's not wait. How many years has it been? Uh, 10 years? Six. Let's not Feels wait like six that. years to reconnect again, <laughs> right. okay? Sounds great. FOMO. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on the web at FOMOSapiens.com or PatrickMcGinnis.com, where you can get all kinds of free resources to live a more decisive and entrepreneurial life. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis, and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstro. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com. FOMO. FOMO.